Is your pet afraid of storms, just like little Toby here? Anxious about car rides or just a little high strung? Coming up on the Paw Report, Dr. Sally Foote from Tuscola is back to tell us all about the newest anxiety treatments for our pets. Don't go anywhere. That's right around the corner on the Paw Report. Welcome to the Paul Report. I'm your host, Kate Pleasant. Today we are here with Dr. Sally Foote from the Ocal Veterinary Clinic in Tuscola, and we're talking about pet anxiety. Mm -hmm. But first, do you want to tell us a little bit about some of your uh, specialties and qualifications? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm a veterinarian, and I am also a certified animal behavioral consultant by the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants. It's a level of um, you know, having extra expertise and education in uh, behavior care and behavior medicine for pets. And so I not only have a general, you know, small animal practice in Tuscola, but I also offer uh, behavior uh, consultations mm -hmm. and services to the general public and through referrals from primary uh, veterinarians. Okay, and um, just so people that are watching, we have Ranger here on the table. Ranger yeah. is your office cat, yes. and that's Butterscotch it's over Butterscotch, there. Butterscotch, my He's baby. a good boy. They're joining us today to help us maybe talk and demonstrate about some of these anxiety practices. Uh -huh. um, but do you first want to talk about um, animal behaviors and anxieties in general? Um, sure. I know you have uh, learned some things at a conference not too long ago, and so maybe you could talk to us about that. Sure. Um, anxieties in pets uh, do happen and it's not really a training problem. You know, it can be from a learn something bad happened, but also too what we found, our finding is that there's often a medical link mm -hmm. with often a lot of these anxieties, meaning that, for example, um, dogs that may be chronically licking surfaces, what we may call a compulsive disorder, many of them actually have inflammation in the intestines that is causing some pain and that routine like a broad spectrum deworming and get them getting them on a hypoallergenic diet mm -hmm. is what resolves that behavioral sign and symptom. The other thing that your veterinarian can also offer is uh, really screening the pet for any underlying medical issue that mm -hmm. is making the behavior problem worse and um, as well as diagnosing you know what's going on and with anxieties there are medications that can help to decrease the anxiety so then the dog or the cat can learn mm -hmm. the better alternative behaviors that will help them totally get over the anxiety and these medications are not tranquilizers or not like dumbing your pet yeah, down. That's going to be my question though, does it make them no, groggy all no, day? No, no, actually they're very similar to a lot of the human medications and also too we now have even supplements that help to supplement the healthy brain chemical. So we're not even going so much from a, just a drug, you know, perspective mm -hmm. drug level. We're going with supplementing the building blocks so their body is building up more serotonin, more GABA, more dopamine, norepinephrine, some of you have heard these words. Uh -huh. um, and lastly, there is even a diet to help reduce anxiety in dogs and cats. Okay. It's a veterinary diet, but that has just come available and it has worked very well. For my other dog I, who, uh, is fearful of a lot of strangers. Mm -hmm. That's why she's not on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have Butterscotch, who's definitely not You'll afraid. see her pictures in a lot of my uh, blog posts because uh, she's great, whatever, a great dog to write about these things, mm -hmm. but she's not good for TV right now. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, but she's been on the food and has helped her tremendously. And our other office cat, Mercy, too. Sometimes she'd be a little cranky, and um, we got her on this diet, and it's helped her a lot as well. Mm -hmm. I'm visiting with Ranger right yes. now. He's, he's being very friendly. Thank you, Ranger. Clearly no anxiety here with no, this No, you know, Ranger, he's just like, wow. Uh, <laughs> He arrived to us from underneath a truck. Oh, really? <laughs> he rode in the wheel well in a truck from Wisconsin. So he and rode he in. Pulled off at the Road Ranger in Tuscola. He jumped out <laughs> from underneath it, and a good Samaritan brought him to our office. Like, what do we do with a stray cat? And because he was so friendly and easygoing, we decided to keep him. Well, that's great. He's definitely yeah. not an anxiety case. Right. No, he he doesn't. No, he, that's not his deal. <laughs> but some animals are. I have right. a dog. Um, I have two dogs, and one of my dogs, um, Toby, one of the smaller, they're Bichons. Uh -huh. He has severe anxiety with storms and mm -hmm. I know that's pretty common it with is. a lot of pets and is there something that you can do for a pet that has anxiety like that with yes. storms? Yes. There's a number of things that can be done. So that's where it's best to talk to your veterinarian and, or 
And if your veterinarian is not as well, um, whatever, uh, knowledgeable, mm -hmm. then they can refer to like someone like me or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, basically, there's a couple things you can do at home. First of all, your dog is getting anxious long before the storm starts, and you probably notice that. Mm -hmm. And that's because they connect that what we call triggers. Mm -hmm. Things like they feel the wind speed starting to pick up. They can smell the rain coming. They can uh, hear the thunder off before we hear it. And at those points when they're first starting to get anxious, that's when we want to give them, you know, help to reduce their anxiety. Right. Some of the things that are you can do at home or whatever that are help with anxiety in dogs are, first of all, there's a calming spray for dogs. It's a pheromone spray. It's available at your pet stores and through a lot of your veterinarians. And Butterscotch is wearing a, yeah, you're wearing a bandana. And so what we would do is spritz the bandana with it okay. and he inhales it and this pheromone and it's the mother dog pheromone they're different products on the market but you want the mother dog pheromone product when he inhales it it actually hits his calming center in his brain and helps him to calm down uh, okay then because butter has thunderstorm fears too okay then what we do is music therapy helps a lot of these dogs these dogs like to listen to heavy beat rock music or so um, rock and rollers. You would yes, not necessarily and, think that a dog would like rock and roll. But. Well, it, what it does, it's like this biofeedback that okay. they that beat at about 130 beats per minute actually okay. helps to hold their heart rate. So we did our office, we made up a Butterscotch's playlist <laughs> because when I attended a seminar about this and found this out, we made recommendations for certain songs mm -hmm. like, you know, um, the American Woman by the Guess Who, and, and so another one by like the Dust, one of my clients, yeah, yeah okay. said, wow, that saved my dog during the storm. So that helps to hold their heart rate slower. Then lastly, we're going to teach them to go to like a safe area, like an enclosed area. Okay. And you may fill something like this, which is a food puzzle mm -hmm. with food, as I'd say to Butter, let's go back here. And then he has something positive happening okay. during the storm that helps to reduce his anxiety. Now, some dogs are really, really affected. Mm -hmm. They are drooling, they are panting, they will not stop moving. I mean, they're at a high level of anxiety. And these products just aren't quite enough. Now, for some of them, we may put them on some medications, mm -hmm. and it's not tranquilizers. You know, just putting them on only on the tranquilizer can have them kind of drunk, but they're still scared. Okay, as I say, because I've heard that, you know, you hear, oh, well, tranquilizers would be good because it'd make the dog sleepy and ignore right. it, but their brain's still working. You just kind of paralyze their body. Is that kind of the way it's what related? What we do. Yes, that's, that's a good way to put it. Now, you can combine an anti-anxiety medication mm -hmm. with the tranquilizer. Then we can reduce the fear. The dog is at least, ah, you know, calm and mm -hmm. tranquil. And we want them at a point where they will still, like, accept or take, like, a reward or a treat for it. Then after, like, a second or third storm, storm oftentimes we can get the tranquilizer part off of them. They still take the anti-anxiety medication. And then they're learning through that uh, storm season mm -hmm. how to go to their safe place, you know, how to, you turn on the music, et cetera. And they calm down much more earlier in the storm so they don't get as upset. We don't get these dogs trying to escape out the front door mm -hmm. and just, I won't go on with horrible Tearing stories. Tearing up carpet. Tearing up carpet. And and, all kinds of things. Right, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, for last, I forgot to mention, for some dogs, the calming wraps, there are these kind of mm -hmm. jackets that you put on the dog and they Velcro and go, I'm not gonna make you stand up, buddy, but they Velcro around the body. Okay, uh -huh. And putting pressure on the body can help to reduce their anxiety during storms as well. And you can even spray the pheromone spray mm -hmm. on, on a jacket, jacket like that too to help, you know, give it to them. Okay. And what does that do, you know, that pressure? What does that make them feel? Well, uh, we don't have, you know, documented evidence, but um, I would just say this based on uh, what I've read about it and what I've seen how it works, mm -hmm. is that Again, it's that when there's pressure on like the body, like if somebody wrapped you up in something snug, sure. you're, you may get a feeling of, I don't want to fight against this mm -hmm. because it's holding me still. So you physically calm down. Right. Okay. Just like swaddling some babies, get them like to babies. stop crying and stop to, so you know, kicking and screaming or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's because it's like, oh, I can't fight against it, so I'll calm down. Then they're physically calm. And that helps them become mentally calm. Okay, that okay. makes sense. So for some dogs, it will work. What I tell most of my clients is if you find your dog is seeking to, like, get between the wall and the back of the couch, you know, they're mm -hmm. making a place for them to be kind of snug underneath the furniture, then they're self-seeking mm -hmm. that pressure. And the thunder shirt or whatever, the anxiety wrap and other wraps 
would likely give them help. Now it's interesting, this product or these kind of wrappings can also help with cats. Okay. And so with Ranger, because sometimes he and our office cat Mercy get a little cranky with each <laughs> uh -huh. other, he has little t-shirts he wears and when he puts on his t-shirt he doesn't fight with Mercy as much. Really? Yes. So it's not only anxiety, it's kind of a behavioral thing as well. So. Well yeah, and, and anxiety is behavior, so right. yeah, that's how they go together, but it's the I guess using the word anxiety is kind of the mental and the biochemical. Right, right. <laughs> but what you're seeing is the behavior, which That's is resulting from, right, that. resulting from it. Yeah. Okay. And so, what are some of the other kind of anxieties that animals have that we may need to watch for? Um, I would say, okay, so in dogs, uh, separation anxiety. Now, okay. separation anxiety, there are three different types of it, three different classifications mm -hmm. of it. And it can range from as mild to, you know, the dog is, say, drooling um, and maybe just pacing around a lot to full-blown. He is trying to escape. They're digging out at the door. They're pulling the, um, you know, trim off from around the door mm -hmm. or the windows. Uh, and they are really, you know, howling a lot and very destructive. Um, that's one type of anxiety. Other anxieties can be fear of, like unknown people, mm -hmm. fear of children, fear of other dogs. A lot of aggression that we see in the dogs where they're lunging mm -hmm. and barking and maybe even ultimately going to biting is actually based in fear and anxiety. Really? Okay. It's not because they're a mean dog. And that may have been from lack of socialization as a puppy or it just may be like how they are. Mm -hmm. Or they may have something else going on internally that's affecting their healthy brain chemicals that they're not healthy. And that what we're seeing is a resulting anxiety. I, it was interesting, I had a case of a thunderstorm phobia in, an, in a somewhat older dog. Mm -hmm. And in part of our workup, we ran some blood work, turned out she had some underlying liver problems. Hmm. When we treated the liver problems, and this dog could not, I mean, was up and down off the bed for two years. This woman and her dog were not sleeping through any storms. After the first exam, gave her some meds, but we got the liver problem straightened out. And within like two weeks, that dog was sleeping through storms without any medication because the liver was healthier. Really? Right. So, so there may be underlying problems. So when would it be time to consult your veterinarian then if you suspect anxiety problems? As soon as you suspect an anxiety problem. I mean, if you are seeing like, gosh, why did he destroy and chew this up? It may not just be naughty dog. Or your cat. If my cat is like howling and pacing, or especially if you have other housemate cats mm -hmm. fighting or maybe not using their litter box appropriately, it may be an anxiety problem in that cat. So definitely consult your veterinarian or a veterinarian with expertise in, in behavior. Okay. And so... Is anxiety something a pet can get over or outgrow? Is that, a, is that a possibility? Not really, because what is happening is they can't like outgrow it because mm -hmm. what they're lear they're learning to be anxious in those settings. Right. They're learning to be anxious in those situations. So actually, it gets worse over time, mm -hmm. and that's one thing. It, a lot of times people, maybe because they don't understand, and that's why we're doing the show, right, exactly. is they delay even asking anyone about that, their veterinarian or their groomer or anyone, to say, gee, you know, why does my dog, you know, always pant and drool and he keeps tearing up the carpeting at the door? He's just a bad dog. No, 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 no. He's at a high level of anxiety. And no, this won't quit and this won't get better. He needs some help. Okay, so that's when you should consult your veterinarian. Absolutely, or like yes. You said, maybe even mention it to a groomer or somebody. They might know something. That well, they can yeah, it'd be best to talk to, to your veterinarian. But even a lot of groomers, I think, in that are becoming a little more knowledgeable to say, I, I don't think he's just bad puppy or she's right. just bad kitty. Right. Talk to your vet. Get get together with your veterinarian. So just know it's not necessarily a permanent condition. Absolutely, yeah, okay. right. That too. And are there different anxiety levels or anxieties between different pets, cats, dogs? whatever the animal might be, um, or related to breed or anything like that? Yes, you can see, um, for example, at different, say, life stages. Like mm -hmm. your pet may have, a dog like Butterscotch, he's 16 years old, okay? Never really had any kind of anxieties except for the thunderstorm thing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, with aging in dogs, you can get a type of senility. And it's called cognitive dysfunction syndrome. And so we may see another like anxiety, like he's now afraid to go down the stairs. Mm -hmm. Or maybe now he starts to show signs of separation anxiety because he's aging in his brain. And that anxiety is because of the cognitive dysfunction. And we would treat that a little differently okay. than we would a separation anxiety in a young pet. Uh, some of our breeds really have a high need for aerobic exercise and they're not getting it. Mm -hmm. Especially our shepherds, like our um, Australian shepherds, our blue healers our Labradors, our big dogs don't get enough aerobic exercise and 
because they lack that, they then may show anxiety problems. And in our cats, we don't have enough places for them to perch and jump up and have enough space for the cats and investigate their home and environment. So you may see the cats kind of fighting or be like, ah, oh, don't touch me, or mm -hmm. people come over and the cat's hiding. And that's really related because for the cat, they don't have as enough, you know, um, like space for the cat. Right, home. right. Okay, so there's other things that you should look at when you're considering anxiety. So those are anxieties that people right. may not always think of, you know, like yeah. your pet not getting enough exercise. That's Absolutely. One last thing I forgot to say too is mm -hmm. chronic pain. Okay. Chronic low level pain. Pets do not cry. They're not going to be limping and all that. So they may be guarding their body or anxious. Are you going to touch me? Mm -hmm. Because my back hurts and especially in cats. Cats are the classic hiders of disease. Mm -hmm. So if you're now you're starting to see some anxiety, it could be related. Again, that's more medical of perhaps a low level bit of chronic pain. Okay. And we talked a little bit earlier about biting and mm -hmm. how that can be a result of some anxiety. So is there a way to tell? I mean, between bad dog and anxiety dog, is there any really? Good it goes way to tell? by. I'm sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> it goes by the history. Mm -hmm. What is the setting? What is the situations this occurs in? And honestly, this is where we use a lot of either videotape. We don't want to put the dog into the setting of biting. Sure. The dog is actually giving a lot of warning signals before he goes to bite. Mm -hmm. The problem is that. A lot of pet owners don't, can't recognize, they haven't learned how to recognize their dog's body language that's showing, I need to get out of here, I need more space, please stay away from me, person. But this, say, child keeps rushing up to mm -hmm. the dog and the dog's trying to duck away and the dog can't get away, so then avoidance isn't working, so I go to aggressing. So it's history, it's, you know, um, seeing the body language of the dog. Then we can determine what the source, the motivation for the aggression is. Yes, there are some dogs that are just downright, outright aggressive, mm -hmm. but it's a very low percentage. I mean, we're under easily 5% of all aggressive dogs that it's just because he's a bad dog. Okay. There's a reason why he's choosing aggression as a tool and that's my job. Right, right. So it's <laughs> to just figure it's, that one out. Not actually a lot of bad dogs out there. Correct. It's no, a that's right. Issue. Okay. Right. Um, we kind of you kind of touched on it, but let's talk about small children and mm -hmm. dogs because a lot of dogs haven't had small children in the home right. and they're introduced to small children. I know that can cause some anxiety. What would be your recommendations there? Well, if if you have children already mm -hmm. and you're considering getting a dog, I would not recommend getting a dog until. For if you have a home with children less than the age of six. And the reason why is that your children need to learn how to interact with the dog the right way, as well as your dog learning to tolerate, you know, high shrieking, fast running around. I mean, mm -hmm. your children are going to be children. So it's a two-way street. So it's best for you if you haven't had dogs yet. Now, let's say you already have a dog, mm -hmm. and now you're having children, and your dog now needs to be rewarded for everything what the kids do in that. I also recommend having a setup for safety, so baby gates in the house, mm -hmm. especially with toddlers. It's not about punishment. When your kids are being active or your children are toddling near the dog, like especially an older dog like Butterscotch, right. you may trip over him and that would hurt him and he may bite or attempt to bite just mm -hmm. from startling or because it hurt. I'm going to have him on the other side of the baby gate, give him a reward, make it good for him, where I can keep an eye on my toddler if I can't keep an eye on the two of them. And last, so, and, but if you don't have kids, but you're out at the park and your dog's kind of like a little timid as he sees the children on the mm -hmm. playground, take some of the food, kibble with you on the walk. As you walk by that park, you're going to say, Butter, watch me. And I give him a kibble. As we walk past that playground, now he associates, oh, something yummy with screaming children okay. <laughs> and running children. <laughs> and um, there are programs in most of the schools of teaching the kids how to properly, you know, greet the pets. Mm -hmm. One last thing I tell all parents, I don't care if you think you've got Lassie and the most perfect dog. Right. Never, 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 I don't know how many times I could say that, leave your child alone with that dog. Not even to grab a glass of water. Not even to answer the telephone. Mm -hmm. Take the child with you or pop that dog on the other side of the baby gate. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, I have a small child and that's something we learned. We had the dogs first and then right. we introduced, but when we got the dogs too, and I don't know if this is the right or wrong thing to do, we were constantly touching ears, touching that, No, that's a great thing to do, yes. Since they were babies, because we knew eventually we'd have children. So we were touching foot pads, touching that's, ears. That's the right thing to do. Fingers and mouth, and that And reward kind of thing. when you're doing it. You make it good for the dog, because then that's how he learns to tolerate that, because it's going to happen. Your toddler may go, oh, butter, boing, boing, boing. Sorry, right. <laughs> and see how he likes this, because he loves attention right, right. but if he now knows even this touching something good's gonna come for me you right. know or even just verbally praising him oh, what a good boy like that when you touch him mm -hmm. that 
helps to prepare him. Right, and we've been doing that with my son as well. You know, when he uh -huh. comes up to the dog, we teach him gentle. You know, right. you put your hand gently on the dog, and then we praise him and we praise the dog. Everybody was good in this Very situation. Good. That's right. So that's right. Um, I assume that kind of goes along with the positive reinforcement. Yeah, and the same thing true with cats, cats. as well. Mm -hmm. You know, with your cats, I think with cats, they really need to like if this was your home with your smaller son, right. uh -huh. I would clear off that bottom shelf. So if your son runs running up to Ranger, Ranger can hop up out of his way at okay. least. Okay, okay, kid. You're settled, now I'll let you touch me. Right. And then you as a parent can then say, okay, now you're gonna pet Ranger from his head back mm -hmm. and give him maybe a little treat or that so that we make it positive for the cat, plus for cats that they have enough places to get away from the children. Right. And that's what helps the cat to be less anxious and reduces the likelihood of the cat biting the children or scratching mm -hmm. the children. Because that would probably, to me, seems like a natural reaction. If the animal's bothered by the activity, they would kind of go away. And they need a place to get mm -hmm. away. Right, exactly. You know, they need so. that kind of escape hatch. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, it makes sense. You know, kids are busy and yeah. animals don't always like that. So, right. Um, what would you do about an animal that just doesn't go away? You know, maybe he doesn't get it. He's, it's bothering him, so he may nip. Oh, I see. Something at a right. child, you know, right. but he refuses to change the situation. Is there something you can do to help the animal and the Ye child get along that way? The place to start there, you know, first of all, we got to, again, we'd want to look at why is the dog reacting this way? Mm -hmm. I mean, because a lot of these interactions are the dog may have a chronic ear infection or the cat or pain, so we want to be sure we're clearing that up. But mm -hmm. the second thing is, if that dog is just, what that dog is saying or cat is saying is, you're too close, I don't have enough space, give right. me more space, because otherwise I'm now going to, I'm going to tell you to get away mm -hmm. if I can't get away. So <clears throat> make sure in your home, you have like, say, for your cat, a cubby or a place you can get away from the right. child or set up the baby gate. You put the dog on the other side, but then with the child, supervised by mm -hmm. the adult, right. we're gonna have that child take some of the food kibble and toss it over the baby gate to this dog who hates this child. Okay. <laughs> now this dog's, now the dog's got safety. He doesn't need to growl, he doesn't need to lunge or bite. And now we've got this dog says, oh, you're not so bad. You're giving me something good. Now, mm -hmm. this is not the fix it for everybody, right. but I'm just saying this is the basis. We're now having this child connect to something positive, but the dog has to have enough like space and setting that he's not at the level of attempting to growl or attempting to bite. Okay. Now, lastly, there may be some dogs or cats that just have had, just can't do it. Mm -hmm. And we may need to either rehome the pet or if it's grandma or grandpa's house, find a place to board that pet for the day that your grandkids sure. come over. You know, really it's better for everybody. Or set up an area in the basement and say, kids, you don't go down here. Right, that's just, just a dog. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Dr. Sally Foote, we thank you for coming on the show today and we appreciate you talking about pet anxiety. Hopefully our audience got some good tips there. So well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with The Paw Report by providing expert guests for the show or animals to be featured on our Adoptable Pets segment, please contact us by emailing kfpleasant at eiu.edu or call 581-6960. Or if you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. Donating blood is an important and life-saving activity that saves countless lives every year. But it's not just human lives that are being saved. Meet Winston. The playful boxer donates every few months to help other animals. The blood taken from this visit was used to help a Yorkie named Barkley who lost blood during an operation. Dogs and cats need blood, just like we do in emergency situations. Winston knows what it's like to need help. He had to be nursed back to health. Winston was seriously wounded, starving, and infected after someone threw acid on him. The Lewis family with four kids adopted him, and he's now healthy as a horse, so to speak. Did you know full episodes of The Paul Report are on YouTube? They can be accessed at youtube.com slash weiutv. Then just go to The Paul Report playlist and select the episode you want to see. More information about the show is also available 24-7 on our website at weiu.net under the television tab.